Excellent. Um, so I'll just start by saying welcome to this very special Ian Ramsey Centre Humane Philosophy uh, seminar. It is special because we've run it together uh, with a partner here, uh, Pusey House. Uh, it's the first of our hopefully many collaborations uh, and I'll hand over to Jonathan Price from Pusey House to tell you a little bit more about the event uh, and to introduce the speaker. Uh, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jonathan Price from Pusey House. Yes, uh, wait till you hear what I have to say before clapping, please. Uh, so, I'm a Pusey Fellow here. Uh, and I run now the Center for Theology of Law and Culture, and uh, we are doing some public theology, just a bit of law, we just had a colloquium on the British Constitution and Christian theology. We'll have one on whether corporations are persons. Uh, yes, but is the, is the answer we're going to give, probably. But if you want to dissent, uh, please do join us in the return. Uh, information on the website and culture will have Handel's Messiah here on the 10th of December as a public performance by the Luciano Choir, uh, with, which is also a form of Christian worship where you'll be both an, an audience member and you will also be a congregant. So please do join. More about that at the end. Um, we recognize that times are difficult and also that we need to keep the lights on, or <laughs> in this case, install lights in here. I'll pass this around, and there's a card machine inside if you should like, which will be uh, installed when it comes around. And we will pass a little sheet around that allows you to sign up for more information on the Recollection Lecture series, of which this lecture is a part. Recollection series is meant to recall the great themes and persons of Christian history, and to give a little entry into discussions, which can allow you, at whatever level you're coming to the discussion, to go a few steps further. Um, that being said, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Ralph Weir. Uh, Ralph and Mika Wai and I have engaged in the incestuous practice in Oxford of um, meeting persons while you're up and then starting to collaborate and keeping it going. And the Humane Philosophy Project is one example of that, which we were part of the inception of, and they've taken it to great heights. And we try when we can and when the others are doing virtuous things to allow them to come and and support them to do it wherever we are. So Ralph is coming to us lately from, or recently from, University of Lincoln, where he's, he's lecturer in philosophy. Uh, formerly he was, or firstly, he was at Reading, studying philosophy, then came to Oxford at Blackfriars, uh, where we were all, all together, uh, students, where he did um, a lot of MST in ancient, ancient, history, ancient philosophy, and then the BPhil after that, and finally to Cambridge, to Jesus Cambridge, where he PhD, and he is going to speak to us about in defense of the soul against modern detractors and ancient, perhaps. We'll see. So, without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Ralph Weir. The mind body problem is essentially as follows. On the one hand, you have regular physical properties. You have height, shape, weight, just like an ordinary physical object such as a rock, maybe something more complex like a clock, maybe something really complex like a bush. But on the other hand, you also have a whole load of mental or spiritual properties. So you have thoughts, intentions, beliefs, desires. You're capable of making choices and taking responsibility for your choices. Perhaps most vividly of all, there is something it's like to be you from the inside, as it were. We usually suppose there's nothing it's like to be a rock or a clock or probably a bush, but there is something it's like to be you. And, mysteriously, there is something you for whom Things are like that. Now, the problem is explaining what's going on here. Why is it, or how is it, that you have such different properties? And there's a traditional answer to the mind-body problem, which says 
The explanation is that in addition to your body, you have an immaterial soul. Your body is the bearer, or the principal bearer, of your physical properties. Your soul is the bearer of the mental or spiritual properties. And perhaps when they're combined together, we can speak of the union of the two being the bearer of both. <coughs> now, as many of you are aware, this view, sometimes called soul-body dualism, is very unpopular in recent philosophy. Otherwise, diverse movements such as Wittgensteinianism, Quinean naturalism, deconstruction, neo-Aristotelianism, find common ground in their firm rejection of any kind of soul-body dualism. They don't always acknowledge that common ground. In fact, they often spend time accusing one another of being covert dualists. Nonetheless, officially, they all reject this idea. And this is not just a trend within philosophy. On the contrary, throughout the sciences, the natural sciences and social sciences and the humanities, one can find multiple examples of the anti-dualist trend. It wouldn't be going too far to say that we live in a psychophobic age and to some degree a somophilic age as well. Intellectuals are constantly reminding us that we have bodies, but you're in danger of causing considerable consternation if you suggest that they might also have a soul. Now, I work to a significant extent on the mind-body problem, and I've come to view it as a kind of nexus of bad scholarship and wrong thinking, in large part due to the strange horror that present-day intellectuals have at the idea of the soul. And I'm very grateful to Jonathan for inviting me to come and tell you about this. I actually had the honour of being taught ancient Greek tragedy by Jonathan when I was a graduate student here about ten years ago. And the uh, report card was mainly positive. <laughs> but uh, it did say something to the effect of, Ralph needs to develop his nascent sense that analytical philosophy is not everything. So I'm not going to go deeply into the technical issues as an analytical philosopher might in this talk. Instead, this is going to be a rousing philippic full of sweeping generalizations and unsupported assertions. And I hope, hope that's uh, what you're expecting. However, I do, as uh, some of the advertising material for this talk says, have a book coming out next year with Rat Ledge. It's going to be called The Meta... The Meta... <laughs> the mind-body problem and metaphysics, or possibly the other way around, where I do go into a lot of the technical details. And I explain why it is I think the idea of the soul isn't going to go away, even in the most hard-nosed theoretical philosophy of the future. Now, it seems to me that the contemporary antipathy to soul-body dualism has given rise, or encouraged, two misconceptions. And both of these can be found in Gilbert Ryle's 1949 book, The Concept of Mind, which he published when he was Wayne Fleet Professor of Metaphysics here at Oxford. And they are as follows. First of all, any kind of soul-body dualism is an idiosyncratic, largely Western view, principally due to Descartes. Secondly, soul-body dualism has nothing going for it, theoretically. Rather than taught both of those views in his very influential book, but he's by no means alone. And I'm going to begin by talking about the first of these ideas, the idea that mind-body or soul-body dualism is a Cartesian idiosyncrasy. Following that, I'll talk about whether there's anything going for the idea, even in contemporary philosophy, science, or whatever discipline you think holds authority here. But I think it's worth considering the uh, former question first about how common or unusual the view is, because it helps bring out what a strange place the idea of the soul has in the contemporary intellectual culture. So I'm going to start by saying something about the Bible. And one of the reasons why this topic is interesting is that it's a case where detached theorising brings us up 
close to what are traditionally regarded as religious issues. Indeed, when I started thinking about this topic, I wasn't a particularly uh, devout person. Uh, however, it always seemed to me that the utter failure of materialism to account for the spiritual or mental heart of human nature was one reason to take religion, or religion as traditionally conceived, seriously. It came as some surprise to me, therefore, to learn that many of the leading contemporary Christian thinkers are no less fierce opponents of the soul than new atheists or postmodern sociologists. As Brandon Rickover says in the first quotation on the handout, here is a staggering truth. The ontology of the human person currently embraced by the most vocal Christian scholars working on the issue is a view that almost no Christians thought plausible only a hundred years ago. Until recently, the dominant view among Christian thinkers has been various forms of mind-body dualism, according to which the human person comprises body and soul. In stark disagreement, many contemporary Christian scholars vigorously advance anti-dualism and defend physicalism, understanding human persons as fundamentally physical. Now, this is surprising in part because it's entirely uncontroversial that from the Church Fathers onwards, most of the influential Christian thinkers have endorsed some kind of overt mind-body or soul-body dualism. The reply put forward by contemporary thinkers tends to be that although that is the case, this is a kind of corruption of Christian thinking by Greek philosophy. One of the first people to put forward this view was the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century, who says that the enemy has sown spiritual errors by mingling with scripture the vain and erroneous philosophy of the Greeks, especially of Aristotle. The soul in scripture signifieth always either the life of the living creature and the body and soul jointly, the body alive. So, Hobbes blames Aristotle for widespread soul-body dualism among Christian thinkers. That strategy of arguing this uh, corruption from Greek philosophy has remained prevalent, or it's had a renaissance in recent times, though it's usually Plato who is uh, given the blame nowadays. Now, there is a problem with this view, that the soul in the scripture signifies only the uh, living body. And that is that there are many, many biblical verses, principally but by no means only in the New Testament, which seem to suggest otherwise. So, for example, in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Well, if, if the soul signifies only the life of the body, that makes no sense, of course. Or Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 10 says, We are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Well, if Hobbes is right, Hobbes is essentially an Epicurean, he thinks we're made entirely out of uh, matter then speaking about uh, what we did while in the body and what we did afterwards, or being away from the body and with the Lord, would make no apparent sense. Now, this has come to be widely recognised in more recent biblical scholarship, as uh, some of you will know. In particular, the great biblical scholar N.T. Wright, who spoke here, I believe, this summer, has done a great deal of work to show that not only the New Testament, but also many intertestamental Jews believe that the soul was sufficiently distinct from the body that, well, the person will survive bodily death and continue to exist in some way prior to any bodily resurrection. What's strange, however, is that neither Wright or other scholars who agree with him about this conceives on that basis that, of course, therefore the biblical view is some kind of soul body dualism. On the contrary, Wright goes out of his way to resist any such idea. In a recent 
article, he argues that the biblical view is not dualism but holism, according to which the human person is, as he calls it, an ontologically differentiated unity. Now, I have no objection to the use of the term holism in this uh, context. No doubt there are views of human persons that are more holistic, views that are more atomistic. But we shouldn't let ourselves suppose that holism in this context is an antonym for dualism. The antonym for dualism is monism. And of course, we can ask the question, is this a holistic monism, according to which there's only a material component? Or is it a holistic dualism, according to which there's also some immaterial component capable of surviving bodily death? And Wright is very clear that he thinks the second is the correct answer. Now, this leads Wright to say some quite strange things, at least if you're coming at this from the perspective of contemporary philosophy of mind. For example, he says, it simply won't do to demonstrate that the New Testament shows awareness of aspects of human life which appear to be non-material, and to conclude from that that some kind of dualism is therefore in position. Likewise, he says, re referring to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says he wasn't sure if an experience he had was uh, within the body or outside the body, right, says the fact that Paul can consider the possibility that experiences might not have been in the body does indeed indicate that he can contemplate non-bodily non -bodily experiences. But I don't think that one can straightforward, uh, straightforwardly argue from this to what is now meant by dualism in philosophical circles. Now, as I say, I predict that that will sound very strange to anyone trained in philosophy. On the contrary, of course that's what dualism means in contemporary philosophical circles. If I am in a philosophy and mind seminar and I say, well, I reckon you could still have experiences outside of the body, I will be immediately labelled as a dualist. And I know this because I do it regularly. <laughs> Wright also makes much of the idea that the New Testament doesn't usually refer to this thing that survives bodily death as the soul of Sukha. He says, Paul is of course clear about an intermediate existence, but he never names the psuche as the character, sorry, carrier of that intermediate existence. Had the earliest Christians wanted to teach that the soul is the part of us which survives death and carries our real selves until the day of resurrection, they could have said so. But with a solitary exception in Revelation 6-9, they never do. Now, this is very strange. First of all, even if the New Testament never described the thing that survives bodily death and awaits the resurrection as the soul of Sukha, that would be a perfectly reasonable term to apply according to one very prevalent use of that Greek word at that time, as the authors of the New Testament were well aware. Secondly, even if that were the case, the metaphysical implications are the same. We have a material, non-material, or non-bodily dualism. And thirdly, of course, the Bible, as Wright acknowledges, does use the term soul in that way, not only in Revelation, as shown by the quotation from Matthew above. Now, it seems to me, therefore, that we should call a spade a spade and recognise that, at least insofar as we're using the categories of contemporary philosophy of mind, any view on which persons survive bodily death in some kind of incorporeal state is a form of mind-body or soul-body dualism, and a much more robust form of dualism than that put forward by self-identifying dualists in much of the discussion today. And I won't go into this issue in any greater detail, but I do recommend the excellent work by John Cooper, J.P. Morland, Brandon Rickover, and others defending that conclusion. Now, something not all the biblical scholars are aware of is that this discussion is by no, no means unique. It in fact exemplifies a trend that exists throughout cultural studies. And I've chosen a few other examples to share with you here. So first of all, there exists a parallel discussion about dualism, about whether the Tanakh, the Talmud, and later Jewish authorities endorse some kind of dualism. 
And a useful example is that of Maimonides, the most influential Jewish thinker of the Middle Ages. If you put into Google Maimonides on the soul, the first entries you'll find, or the first things that came up for me, were an academic article which asserts that for Maimonides, the body and the soul are one unit. Body and soul are one. Secondly, there's an introductory piece at uh, the website Jewish, non-Jewish uh, relations, which elaborates a bit further. It, it cautions us that when we look at medieval Jewish thinkers such as Maimonides, when they spoke about souls, they were not speaking of things that continue to exist as ghosts of material things that have passed away. What people like Maimonides and Halevi meant when they said that something had a soul is that the thing is alive. Now, from that and from what they don't say, you might well take away the view that uh, Maimonides' position is an essentially monist one continuous with the kind of monist materialist positions that dominate contemporary philosophy. But when you look at what Maimonides himself has to say in Mishnah Torah Repentance, you get a very different picture. He says, for example, that in the world to come, there is no body or physical form, only the souls of the righteous alone, without a body, like the ministering angels. Or regarding certain bodily goods, Maimonides says, these are only considered a great benefit to us in this world because we possess a body and a physical form. In a situation where there is no body, all of these matters will be nullified. There is no way in this world to grasp and comprehend the ultimate good which the soul will experience in the world to come. In truth, there is no way to compare the good of the soul in the world to come to the bodily goods of this world. Maimonides also says rather beautifully that to try to explain to someone embodied the world to come would be like trying to explain to someone blind from birth the uh, nature of a colour. At least that's attributed to him, I didn't find the uh, precise reference. Well, that seems pretty clear to me. If you say in a philosophy seminar, well I reckon that uh, you know, the, the soul does survive without a body in the world to come, even if only uh, for a, a temporary period, you would be classified as very much a dualist. You find the same thing when we turn to the ancient Egyptians. It's well known that Herodotus, in his histories, reports that the Egyptians were the first people to, to put forward the doctrine of the immortality of the soul and to maintain that after death the soul enters another creature at the moment of that creature's birth, something widely believed in Greece at the time. Now, that was uh, for a long time regarded as an authoritative view after all. Herodotus had been to ancient Egypt, we haven't, uh, maybe, maybe he knows better than us. But as Thomas McKevely says in his wonderful book, The Shape of Ancient Thought, for the last couple of generations, despite Herodotus' knowledge of ancient Egypt, his claim that this doctrine came from there has been widely discredited by scholars. They have been, in fact, somewhat curt and authoritarian on the point, almost disapproving, as if the question should never have been raised in the first place. One says the Egyptians had no such theory, without argument point. Another says, also without argumentation, the Egyptians never had such a doctrine, and this is regarded as a closed question. And another, we now know that Herodotus was totally wrong. Metempsychosis is foreign to the Egyptians' way of thinking. Just as an aside, I think the idea that we could work out from our sources that some idea is so foreign to the way of thinking of culture that existed for many thousands of years uh, uh, is uh, kind of unlikely. Well, where does this come from? McEvely identifies an article by Louis Zakbar as the uh, first source of the idea that the Egyptians had no, no idea of metempsychosis. There, Zakbar says that the Egyptian concept of man is not a com composite of the body and soul, and death does not mean a separation of the soul from the body. To translate the bar, as some people wanted to, or any other of the words here discussed as soul, would be a matter of grave inaccuracy. 
Now, McEvoy says in reply, this is quite a long quotation, but I think it's so telling that it is worth reading out. So complete is the consensus on this important point, and so authoritarian in its declaration of the closed question, that it is hard to believe how meagre the argumentation is. In the article that led to the almost universal rejection of Herodotus' claim by Western classicists, Louis, Louis Zakbar argued that in Egyptian culture, there was no idea to correspond directly to the Greek idea of the soul, or psuche. So there could be no doctrine of reincarnation of the Orphic Pythagorean Platonic type, since these theories were based on a soul-body dichotomy. The curious point is that the serious replies that cry out to be made to this simplistic argument have not been made. There is that there is a dualism between the Ba and the body, and that the Ba in certain circumstances separates from the body and ascends to the sky on the death of the body, and that the Uh, is undeniably true. <laughs> the dualism is there. The Egyptians' way of conceptualizing the parts of the person was different to the Greeks. But it does, it does indeed involve a dualism and a separation of parts, one invisible, invisible part, call it spiritual if you will, one visible part, call it physical. Now, one thing I point out there is that it's a common and uh, not very convincing strategy in cultural studies to argue that some culture has no conception of some idea or entity X on the basis that they have no exact synonym for our word for X. And, of course, that simply does not follow. There's a, a wonderful recent New, New Yorker article by Nikhil Krishnan applying that point to studies of emotions across different cultures, which I warmly recommend. Another thing to take note of there is the, what McKevin calls the authoritarian tone of those scholars denying any dualism in ancient Egyptian conceptions of the person. Now, when we turn to the indigenous cultures of Asia, America, and throughout Africa, we find the same pattern. What we find again and again is a culture who unambiguously, quite clearly, have this idea that uh, human persons survive bodily death and continue to interact with community in some way, or at least capable of doing so. And yet the scholars go to any lengths to present this as an essentially anti-dualist position that might act as a salubrious uh, counter to the benighted dualism of Western thought. And I've given a few examples on the handout. So, there's a great article by Edward Slingerland about the situation in a uh, study of ancient Chinese thought. Slingerland, Slingerland says, An almost universally accepted truism among scholars of Chinese religion is that while Western thought is dualistic in nature, early Chinese thought can be contrasted as profoundly holistic. Now, we see here once again this use of holism as a contrast to dualism, and once again we can ask the same question, well, is this the sort of materialist kind of holism, where there's really only one part, a material part, or some material parts but nothing further, or is it a dualistic form of holism, where there's also some immaterial person, spirit, or soul that can survive separately from the body? And Slingerland goes on to show that there's strong evidence from as early as the Shang dynasty but the answer is, there is also the immaterial part, or the person capable of surviving the death of the body. And I don't think that's under the influence of Greek thought, given that classical Greece was several centuries after this. Likewise, by the time of the Han dynasty, the evidence, the textual evidence, becomes overwhelming. Slingerland says, ancient Chinese afterlife beliefs as well as the belief in other supernatural beings, such as ancestral spirits, nature deities, or high gods, were not only widespread, but also fundamentally parasitic on some form of mind-body dualism. These beings were conceived as minds without bodies. You get the same thing emerging again in the scholarship of various indigenous African cultures. I've got a couple of examples on the handout. So one, uh, Nelson Kwame describing the Igbo, philosophical anthropology. Ukwami says that uh, 
Plato, Aristotle, and Aquinas were quite myopic, and this informs the interrogation of another cultural position, that is the immortality of the soul in Igbo African ontology. In Igbo ontology, there is no distinction between body and soul, and the attention, as the attention is on man as a complete being. Death is not a separation of body and soul, as what happens at death is not explicit. Corporeal death is not the end of existence, but that death is rather a gateway to another realm of existence. Regarding uh, SN philosophical anthropology, Godwin Azenaphor says, the author shows that the African theory does not take a dualistic or monistic countenance, rather it asserts a pluralism with a leaning towards a peculiar kind of monistic duality, by providing a more plausible theory with regards to the mind-body problem, with its pluralism and insistence on a reality composed of innumerable constituents, an African theory has important consequences for understanding reality. Now, these are interesting articles, and there's much in the details of SN and Igbo uh, philosophical anthropology that is worth paying attention to. However, it's quite hard to extract from these articles in what sense the views are supposed to be anti-dualistic. And some clarity can be gained from asking the question, well, do these cultures affirm the idea of a person surviving bodily death? And the answer is, in both cases, as indicated in the first quotation, yes. Well, at least in the context of contemporary, present-day philosophy of mind, to present that as on the anti-dualist side is profoundly misleading. On the contrary, this is much closer to dualism than the vast majority of what goes on in present-day philosophy of mind. Now, I have one more fun example from uh, North America, a kind of lovely article by Glenn Matsis arguing that the uh, Anasazi built environment reveals a spiritual attitude towards the sky and its place within the earth that might help us to overcome Western soul-body dualism, as well as the uh, metaphysics, religious creeds, overvalued rationalism, reductive science, and technological imperialism that have plagued the Greek to modern European tradition from its inception in Platonic thought. Uh, however, the story is essentially the same. On the basis of the flintiest of evidence, Nazis insist that this is an anti-dualistic culture. And now, in the case of the Anasazi, we don't actually have any textual records, at least, that we've discovered and can read. So it's hard to prove things one way or another. But the idea that you can tell from the built environment of culture that they're anti-dualistic seems fairly suspect. After all, can we tell from a Roman ruin whether it was lived in by a Platonic dualist or an Epicurean materialist? Moreover, the uh, Platonic dualistic position was predated by various Asian forms of dualism in cultures no less preoccupied with the spirituality of the sky than the Anasazi. Uh, and finally, although we don't know about the Anasazi in particular, it is the case that more or less all American indigenous cultures we do know about affirm some kind of incorporeal survival of bodily death, and to that extent, some kind of soul-body dualism. And this point, in fact, applies very generally indeed. In Lyle Stedman, Craig Palmer, and Christopher Tiller's article, The Universality of Ancestor Worship, they uh, review a classic study of ancestor worship in indigenous cultures and reevaluate the something like 48% of about 60 cultures studied, which were classed as not obviously having ancestor worship. And what they found was, well, ancestor worship is too narrow a category, but in every single case, the culture did indeed have the idea of person surviving bodily death, and this usually played an important role in their religious traditions. Now, this raises the question, right? There are beautiful parallels between these discussions in biblical scholarship, in Jewish theological scholarship, in wider cultural studies. Why is it that scholars do this? Why is 
The soul body dualism of our forebears treated like a shameful secret, something to be swept under the rug insofar as at all possible. And there are some local factors that could be talked about here. Many theologians in the Christian tradition want to avoid drawing attention away from the importance of bodily resurrection. Many cultural scholars, sociologists, are influenced by Derrida or the uh, deconstructionist idea that we need to oppose binary oppositions. And many people are genuinely interested in the important details between different kinds of philosophical anthropology. But I don't think any of these explanations goes to the heart of the matter. A better explanation, more fundamental, is the fact that all of these people regard soul-body dualism as almost certainly false. And at the same time, they want to present these cultures they're studying in a good light, whether it's for the purpose of vindicating Christian theology, or doing down Western culture, or whatever. They want to present it in a good light, and that means playing down any kind of soul-body dualism as much as possible. Moreover, I think that uh, if you are an opponent of soul-body dualism, you might well want it to be the case that this is really a very idiosyncratic position popularised by a wicked Pied Piper such as Descartes rather than the common sense of all humanity, because that would make it much easier to be dismissive of the idea. So we should turn now, and I'm conscious I don't have a huge amount of time to do this in, but it's okay, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you any of these bad arguments. We'll turn now to the question, well, is there anything in this idea? Is it true that there's nothing to be said for the soul-body distinction? And there's two ways we might approach that question. Firstly, from the perspective of empirical science, and in particular, what's known as parapsychology. And secondly, from the perspective of philosophy. So in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded with the central intention of investigating empirically whether there is such a thing as the soul. Some of the first members of the Society of Psychical Research were very distinguished thinkers, scientists, even one future Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, which is significant because that position carried a certain degree of prestige in those days. <laughs> and they studied or set out to test the existence of the soul both directly by things like seances and also indirectly by looking at phenomena such as extrasensory perception and near-death experiences. Now, I won't say anything in detail about this, I will only say my own opinion is that the Society for Psychical Research, despite their enthusiasm, failed to come up with anything convincing in favour of the existence of an immaterial soul. In uh, 1939, in his presidential address to the Society, H. H. Price said, if our study is to become an experimental science in the full sense of that phrase, we must be able to produce the phenomena whenever we like. It is not enough to be able to detect and measure them when they do happen. Now, I think Price was right about that. He Price was a great thinker. And so far as I can tell, that never happened. There are no paranormal phenomena that have been established uh, in a repeatable, testable manner. At least, at least not to my satisfaction. I don't want to say on that basis that there's nothing of, interesting, of interest to study here. On the contrary, we know that some of these phenomena in some sense occur. Uh, a great example of this is uh, that of A.J. Eyre's near-death experience. Eyre, the uh, Wiccan professor of logic, here about 70 years ago, was by no means the kind of person who would make up a paranormal event. But in his well-known article, what, I'm, what I Saw When I Was Dead, he reports that uh, whilst undergoing treatment in hospital and being, by the current standards, medically dead, he had this uh, rather surprising out-of-body or uh, seemingly spiritual experience. He concludes the article by saying, So there it is, my recent experiences have slightly weakened my conviction that my genuine death, which is due fairly soon, will be the end of me. Though I continue to hope that it will be. <laughs> <laughs>
Neither do I want to uh, disparage psychical paranormal research generally. I mean, I do think there's been, you know, little evidence and much, if you'll excuse the strong language, twaddle produced by this uh, uh, research program and perhaps even some deliberate deception. But then, as uh, we all know, regular scientists lie too, as Liam Coffey Bright discusses in his very, very interesting recent article, Why Do Scientists Lie? And so a certain amount of scientific fraud shouldn't allow us to dismiss an entire field. Nonetheless, I would not put any weight on psychical research in defending the existence of something like an immaterial soul. When we turn to philosophy, however, my opinion is that the situation is entirely different. Now, it did seem 40, 50, 60 years ago, as though a materialist, monist consensus were emerging in philosophy that might finally take hold forever. But these days, that is by no means the case. And this is largely to do with uh, work in the area known as consciousness studies. There are some very familiar arguments for thinking that consciousness, the fact that there's something it's like to be you from the inside, cannot be accounted for by a materialist monist ontology. One of the most famous ar arguments often put forward in this context is the Mary argument. Mary, the scientist, knows everything there is to know scientifically about colour perception, but she's never seen colour herself. She's lived in a black and white room all her life. Well, when Mary first goes outside the room and sees the red tomato, the blue sky, it seems as though she learns something new but physical science couldn't tell her. And many thinkers continue to argue that this is because there's something new she knows about, the uh, subjective interiority, which uh, physical science has no way of getting at. Another well-known argument put forward by David Chalmers says that because we can make sense conceptually out of the idea of a physical organism doing everything thus without there being any experience on the inside, it follows this is a logical and hence a metaphysical possibility, i.e. the conscious experiences are something extra on top of the biological states. My own opinion is when sufficiently backed up, both of those arguments are entirely sound. I also think the case against materialism can be seen from the options we have in materialist theories. So essentially there are two, two ways you can go as a materialist. On the one hand you can say, and I'm still just talking about consciousness here, although this point generalises to other phenomena. On the one hand you can say, actually those qualitative states that you seem to know better than anything else in the world don't really exist. That's an easy way of getting around the problem of explaining them in a materialist ontology. But I think Gail and Strawson is right to say that's about the silliest thing anyone's ever said. <laughs> On the other hand, you can be what's known as a type B theory materialist and say they do exist and they are somehow the same thing as the brain or brain states or the nervous system. But <coughs> uniquely for all higher level phenomena, we can make no sense out of why that should be so. And neither of those positions seems at all attractive to me. There is, in a way, a third position, where you say these uh, conscious states do exist, but you uh, surreptitiously explain that when you use the phrase conscious states, you really mean some material phenomenon, like some functional process in the brain, and therefore it becomes very easy to explain how it fits into a materialist ontology. Uh, the former two approaches, I think, you know, interesting work pursuing. The latter, I feel, maybe it's a little mendacious to pursue, to proceed in that way. Now, increasingly, specialists in the philosophy of mind have taken the view that we cannot give a materialist explanation of conscious experience. We must posit something in addition to the physical world. We find here, however, a parallel to the anti-dualist bias I described in cultural studies earlier. Insofar as, kind of amazingly, these theorists still do everything they can to avoid recognising the rather positive implications this insight seems to have. 
but the old idea of soul, body, dualism. I've got a few quotations expressing this attitude. Perhaps uh, one from uh, the great popularizer of science, philosophy, contemporary thought more generally, Yuval Noah Harari, is worth uh, reading out. In his book, very interesting, exciting, fun book, Homo Deus, Harari says on page 52, there is zero scientific evidence that sapiens, humans, have souls. On page 55, Harari says, how is it then that when billions of electric signals move around in my brain, a mind emerges that feels? As of 2016, we have absolutely no idea. Now, it seems extraordinary not to uh, put those two claims together and draw the inference, well, maybe there was something in this idea of an immaterial soul after all. It's not only in the uh, popular literature that you see this pattern. Indeed, the specialists in, mind, in philosophy of mind who establish or re-establish the popularity of dualist views take the same approach. What they tend to say is, well, look, uh, we need to posit something non-material. But these arguments suggest that the physical body has some extra immaterial properties. But those properties don't belong to any kind of separable self or substance that might exist without the body. David Charles says this in the quotation 24. The dualism implied here is instead a kind of property dualism, conscious experience, it, conscious experiences involve properties of an individual that are not entailed by the physical properties. Consciousness is a feature of the world, over and above the physical features of the world, but this is not to say there's a separate substance. The issue of what it would take to constitute a dualism of substances seems quite unclear to me. And as the uh, Kim quotation below shows, and as many other quotations that you, you can find in my forthcoming book, this has become a kind of consensus or perceived consensus opinion in contemporary philosophy. Yeah, there are really powerful challenges to materialism, but they don't lead us to anything like an immaterial soul. Now, this is a strange conclusion to draw for a few reasons. First of all, looking at the history of our ideas, it's fairly clear that the most intuitive alternative to materialism, for most people, is some kind of soul-body dualism, some kind of position where there's a separable entity in addition to the body, not just some extra properties. Indeed, I find it very hard to make sense of what it would be for immaterial properties to belong to something that is otherwise merely a material body. Secondly, and more surprisingly, there exists no widely accepted reason for favouring property dualism to substance dualism in the philosophical literature. There is no widely accepted reason for preferring the popular view over the unpopular one. This is just accepted uh, dogmatically. Thirdly, and most significantly, my opinion is that the kind of arguments that challenge materialism and lead some people to be property journalists, well, one can reverse or invert those arguments to give homologous arguments for thinking that if there's an immaterial thing here at all, it's got to be a separable substance in its own right. Uh, that's essentially what the upcoming book is about, and I go into this in great detail there. But the short story is as follows. If it's true that the fact that we can make sense of the idea of a human organism doing everything it does while it's all dark on the inside without any conscious experience, and if it's true that that shows that the physical organism does not necessitate the existence of conscious states, then likewise, the fact that we can make sense of the idea of someone undergoing experiences outside of the body, as St. Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 12, entails that our conscious lives do not necessitate any material thing, and therefore our conscious lives must involve separate, separable immaterial substances. It would also be possible to invert Jackson's Mary argument by constructing a version with her cousin Elizabeth, the phenomenologist. I haven't filled in the details yet, but the conclusion is going to be roughly the same. And I should add that this is only when we focus on the issue of consciousness. There are countless other aspects of our mental or spiritual lives which materialism is equally unable to accommodate. 
intentionality, personal identity, subjecthood, unity, moral responsibility and agency, the list goes on and on. My opinion is, you know, the, the situation is the same in each case. Uh, I hope to write another book where I go through all of these, but in the meantime, there's some great work, uh, at least on the issue of personal identity, you know, identity and the self, in this context by people like Richard Swinburne and Martina Niederruhmann. Now, what you might be wondering is, well, isn't there this great problem of soul body dualism, however, don't there's this uh, scientific objection according to which an immaterial soul wouldn't be able to interact with the material body? And there does indeed exist a kind of myth in both popular and specialist understanding of philosophy according to which that is the case. However, the myth is highly deceptive. For one thing, it's often put about that this objection was raised by people like Pierre Gassandi and Elizabeth of Bohemia to Descartes himself and undermined dualism from the start. But no one in the contemporary literature adopts anything like Gassandi's or uh, Bohemia's version of the objection, which seems to presuppose that all causation involves physical impact, some, something we just don't have to accept. It is true that in contemporary literature there's an argument known as the causal closure argument and that is often put forward as a reason for rejecting any form of dualism. This argument says in essence that we know empirically that every physical event has sufficient physical causes to bring it about and therefore any immaterial entity such as a soul would be a superfluity in the uh, behaviour of the material world. When I decide to wave my hand in the air, the physical world had already determined that that would happen. My soul could not make any difference to the course of events. And although I said there's no widely accepted reason to prefer property dualism over substance dualism, property dualists do sometimes gesture at this as a reason for rejecting the idea of an immaterial soul. Chalmers on the handout says exactly that. Now, I'd say a couple of things in response. First of all, this argument doesn't give us any reason to prefer property dualism to substance dualism because, as Chalmers and Kim and other property dualists themselves have acknowledged, the exact same problem, if it is a problem, applies to property dualism. Right? If uh, there are immaterial properties that make up my conscious life and immaterial things can't affect my physical behaviour, then property dualism ends up making it impossible for my conscious mental states to affect the physical world just as much as substance dualism does. Furthermore, however, I would add that the causal closure argument is extremely weak. Why is it extremely weak? Well, because it is based on a premise that hasn't received anything like adequate empirical support. When people back up this idea that we know all physical events have sufficient physical causes, they tend to do so in one of two ways. One thing they do, or might do, is say, well, look, this is true of inanimate matter. We've tested it in places like the Large Hadron Collider. We've investigated it in great detail. And then they generalize to the case of animate organisms. But of course, that generalization in this context is highly question-begging, because anyone worth you know, deciding between dualism and anti-dualism has to be open-minded to the possibility there might be some extra influence present in the case of an animate organism. The other approach people sometimes take is to claim that actually biological sciences, observation of the nervous system shows that within the human body and brain, no physical event occurs that does not have sufficient physical causes. Now I think that would give us good empirical grounds against any interactionist form of dualism. If we could, for example, map the mechanics of someone's nervous system in sufficient detail that we can predict what ought to happen next on the basis of fundamental physical laws and show that our predictions are always <coughs> right, that would pose a serious challenge to standard forms of interactionist dualism. But the actual evidence we have for this claim falls so short of that as to be laughable. Indeed, it usually comes down to the observation that it has not yet been proved that that isn't what we would observe if we were able to map the nervous system in such detail. And even if 
you still find the calls of closure argument troubling. It's worth saying the game hardly ends there because there are also non-standard interactionist forms of dualism and non-interactionist forms of dualism, which are invulnerable to that argument, even though they might be vulnerable to others. Now, I'm conscious that I've got to draw to a close. At this stage, you're all already convinced that some kind of soul-body dualism is true. But perhaps some of you still feel some lingering unease. I think that's a common response to these kinds of arguments. Even if you don't really think the causal closure argument is that powerful, then you haven't come across another argument that's a lot better. People often feel that to posit an immaterial soul is to posit something that doesn't fit well into our wider, shared, largely naturalistic or physicalistic worldview. The soul is something too big to add without making further differences. If the soul exists, the world seems a lot more mysterious than it's seen before. Now, I actually think this is right, and I think that often the interaction problem is acting as a stand-in for people's unease about the mysterious implications the existence of something like a soul would have for our wider worldview. I am aware there's been a little philosophical work on this, but not much, largely because we've been too hung up on the interaction problem. And I think sometimes even contemporary dualists play down the mysterious nature of the position of arrived at in a way that exacerbates this problem. They try to describe soul body dualism in a way that makes it sound like a little addition to our wider worldview, uh, something not to be troubled about, not to be in awe of. I think John Henry Newman does a bit better in his sermon, The Individuality of the Soul, which was delivered in 1839 over at the University Church, when he says that a person with a soul has a depth within him unfathomable and infinite abyss of existence, and the scene in which he bears part for the moment is but like a gleam of sunshine upon its surface. Now, I think that Newman is essentially right in what he says there. But I do share the sense of unease about what this means, especially when I have to explain what I work on to other academics. <laughs> to posit a soul is to get yourself quickly into deep water, is to posit something vast and awful. But however uneasy the tremendous mystery of our condition makes us feel, I would urge that there is no justification for refusing to acknowledge that mystery, much less for trying to cover it up. another little word um, which was abolished at the Second Council 
um, of Constantinople in 886, the body, soul, and spirit. They sneaked it in under another agenda uh, and it got in without much of a vote. Uh, the idea was that it was an arrogance to ascribe spirit to a human being. That was God's realm and it was cheeky. You use that word seven times only. And I think if you had that entelechy, which existed in Greece, body, soul, and spirit, um, and move totally away from today's instrument, which makes the answer to your question impossible, that gives us a way of genuinely answering the question, which I can discuss for hours with you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. So, I mean, there, there are a few uh, points there, materialism being very much the ism of the age and the uh, idea of body, soul, and spirit. And, and one thing I didn't say is, I spoke about various traditional cultures uh, that all turn out to have some kind of soul body journalism. Yeah, that's also true in traditional philosophy. The idea is by no means particularly Cartesian or Platonic. What about classical Jain philosophy? What about the Samkhya Yoga or Nia Vaisheshika philosophy of ancient Hinduism? What about Pythagoreanism, Orphism, and so on? Even Aristotelianism, as traditionally interpreted, and certainly as revived in the Middle Ages, has the idea of an immaterial component inspired about the body. But there were always alternative views. There was uh, Epicureanism in the uh, ancient Greek world, the Charvaka school in the uh, ancient Indian world, that were overtly materialist. You can recognise them because they don't talk about anything surviving bodily death. And I feel that something strange has happened. We live in a in the modern Western intellectual world, at least, in the first Epicurean age, where the presumption is people are essentially Epicurean, both in their metaphysics and to some degree in their wider philosophical views. Uh, so I agree. Uh, regarding body, soul, and spirit, I mean, this is a, a, an issue on which there's so much to say, I think I had better say nothing for now. Thank you very much for a brilliant and fascinating talk. Um, it may be right that disembodied existence is possible, but the overwhelming consensus of the Christian tradition is that it's a pretty miserable, truncated way to live. So the, the paradigm example of how to be alive after your death is, of course, the resurrection of Jesus. So what do you think bodies bring to the party? Yeah, well, I enjoy being embodied very much. I always have done, as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> And I think that's exactly right. And I think a, a totally legitimate reason for, or a motivation which is totally understandable for a Christian theologian to be uneasy about dualism sliding in a sort of platonic direction or a Manichaean direction is this uh, affirmation of bodily life. However, I would point out in return that from the church fathers down, the overwhelming consensus has been both that embodiment is good and that there's an immaterial soul. So why not have our cake and eat it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the interesting and lovely talk. I was, I'm, I'm wondering if you really do believe that the indeed universal belief in an afterlife is the same as a belief in both body and soul or dualism as at least according to the Christian conception. Um, because surely you do find, and if, if you look at a lot of the 19th century anthropologists, Tyler and George G. Frazier or Edward Zeller in his study of Greek philosophy, you don't necessarily find um, a division between soul and body. And still less do you find something like an immaterial soul that survives without the body, bodily counterpart. So in Homer, for example, you have shades of phantoms, skia surviving. Um, you have the soul, the suki is, is, is linked physically to breath and can leave the body during swoons and revisit the body. Uh, you have libations being poured for the dead, bodies, shades, ghosts, acting, persisting as they were in the world, terrestrially, in the afterlife. Um, so I wonder if there's a danger in sort of clumping together the universal intuition in the afterlife and indeed the vital impulse that we all share and believe to be is true that we, that we have more to us. There's more in the cause than there is in the effect, as it were, and that we do survive with, with dualism in general, at least under its Christian form. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. Is, so is there, um, is it really right to say uh, these historical traditions of dualists, there's 
some kind of idea of an afterlife that happens after bodily death, but as you say, in Homer it's associated with breath, uh, in many cases it's something you pour libations for, which seems material and, and so on. Uh, I think things do indeed become kind of complex here, and I've written a bit about this with respect to biblical case in particular. Uh, uh, there's a paper that came out this year going into the detail of what counts as dualism in the contemporary context and whatnot. And I think the crucial thing is whether an anthropology posits something that is not fundamentally non-mental. That's the phrase that is central in the contemporary discussions. And my interpretation of these historical traditions is that they certainly do posit such a thing. Uh, I'd have a suppose that, yeah, people often say, well, sometimes uh, the idea of spirits, they can become visible either briefly or, or for a you know, longer period. That suggests they're physical. But Plato also has that idea, right, in the Phaedon. So, you know, if the art dualist of the uh, Greeks has that idea, I don't think we can discount some other viewers uh, uh, counting as, as dualist as Plato on that basis. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe that's enough in the place. Please. Thank you very much for an exciting and fascinating talk. Thank you. The passage that is quoted under number 26 and okay. some of the others reminded me of the words of the German uh, surgeon Rudolf Virchow, who was a materialist in his worldview, and he said that I've conducted hundreds, maybe even said thousands, of surgeries, operations, and never discovered a soul. To which the Russian philosopher uh, Nikolai Bityayev years later responded, had Virchow been able to find a soul that way, it would be an argument against the soul and not in favor of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, funnily, there's a, so, so the, the point is that uh, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't find the soul when slicing up human bodies or nervous systems because it was never supposed to be that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, essentially, I think that does indeed point to something profoundly misleading about the idea that absence of publicly observable evidence is something that most people say is at least usually only uh, privately observable counts against its existence. It's kind of crazy. Uh, however, I mean, it is true that many traditions have affirmed that souls sometimes become uh, uh, visible briefly. Maybe they can have an influence on the matter around them. So suppose I was, you know, slicing up someone's brain as a neuroscientist, and then and then this <laughs> activity starts occurring that has no physical cause. I guess then I'd say, well, maybe that's evidence for a soul. It could be evidence for any 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 invisible. But essentially, I think it's a great, great quotation. In fact, I might try and get it off you at the end so I can uh, steal it. Could we? There's three more questions, and then quarter past we're meant to be out. Uh, it's the gentleman has the mic. The man to his right, the, 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 the gentleman in the, uh, the red shirt. We can probably fit four in if everyone's quick. But do you, are you happy to take that, take responses down and answer them? Yeah, I can. So yeah. Collect your questions and have them at once. Yeah. Right. You know uh, well that I agree with you on, on all these things. <laughs> What's the interesting difference between the immaterialist tradition in the classical and even the medieval world and these arguments to do with consciousness is that the immateriality attached to intellect in the earlier stages and in the, um, since Descartes it's attached mainly to sensory consciousness which was normally thought to be held in, handled in a materialist way by, um, by Aristotle certainly and probably by Plato, um, what do you make of the, and, and nowadays, I mean, I'm now getting into trying to do an anti-materialist account of thinking, which has generally been treated in a behaviorist and a functionist manner in the last um, half century or more. Do you have anything to say on the, on the difference between concentrating on consciousness in the Cartesian tradition and concentrating on intellect in the classical and men's tradition as what shows the immateriality of the, the immaterial part of the human being? I have my answer. Should I wait for the next question? I think we should take more questions and then have the answers, yes. Yes, thank you very much, Ralph, for a fascinating talk. I would like to have heard a bit more about Aristotle. And above, uh, um, as you know, he tends to use the adjective en psychos, en soul, rather than the noun psyche. And there's a profound insight, I think, there, that there's an intimate relation between 
structure and function. Mm -hmm. It's obviously true with nutrition, with digestion, with locomotion, with seeing, with hearing, and we now know that Aristotle didn't, it's true of cognition as well. And I guess the residual objection you referred to at the end to, to dualism is bound up for a lot of people with that thought that introducing an immaterial substance just doesn't address that intimate relationship between function and structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just going to, I mean, along these lines, I just want to know if you're making a distinction between mind and soul. I understand that they can't really confuse the two, and I don't think that's a, I think that's really been a disservice to Christian philosophy over the centuries, to be honest. Uh, because you can say that the mind exists without implying um, that it's a separate entity from the body in terms of its generation at least that's how I would start. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. An excellent talk. Um, I, I would like to turn it round and say um, this, what is the soul? I, I am a soul. I am a self. I, I don't believe I'm an immortal soul or self but there is that uh, which is at the centre of my being which is the consciousness itself if you like a shared consciousness with others and it's that without that shared consciousness we can't even begin to talk about uh, materialism and materials so uh, to my mind the materials and the materialism are subsidiary to the fact of consciousness and the fact that we are souls conversing and um, there's a kind of circular thing going on a recursive thing but uh, to my mind none of the arguments get anywhere near to the uh, the truth or to penetrating uh, what's actually happening. Thank you. Can you answer all of them in one minute? <laughs> <laughs> I can do in one second. Do you <laughs> so, Howard asked uh, about the relationship between wanting to be a journalist because of the nature of the internet and wanting to be a journalist because of the nature of sensory consciousness. I mean, uh, as I hinted at the end, I think there are good reasons in both cases. I'm not so convinced that the idea of sensory consciousness being a reason to be a journalist is only introduced by Descartes. On the contrary, I think Avicenna's floating man argument points in the same direction, and Descartes was perhaps influenced by it. And ancient discussions of the impossibility of being certain or not dreaming, which clearly influenced that kind of view, you know, you find these in lots of early philosophical discussions, not just in Greece. But essentially, I do think there are different motivations that give different reasons for uh, being an immaterialist, and they could lead you to the view that there is more than one immaterial component. I, I suspect there's an argument for not saying that to do with the uni unity of uh, the subject, but one would have to work out that argument. And that relates to what the gentleman in the red uh, jumper was saying about whether mind and soul should be treated as one and the same. And what I say, for the purpose of a broad talk like this, I'm inclined to be liberal uh, about the use of terminology because I'm focusing only on the question, are the materialists right or is there some further immaterial entity? But I entirely agree that we can get into trouble by conflating these terms and you get wind up with very different views whether you think it's a purely intellectual entity, something involved in a, the entire incarnate person in a much deeper way. And, uh, I don't have a really, really uh, firm opinion on where I want to draw the line, or how, how I want to, what conclusion I want to draw. Uh, and that relates to what John said regarding uh, Aristotle on the close relation between structure and function. Uh, I don't know how relevant this is. I mean, I think that one can't get away from some kind of hylomorphism if you have material substances at all. You can't get away from the soul in some sense being form of the body or the living body if you have an immaterial soul plus hydromorphism. So in some way I think something that looks quite like Aristotle's view starts to follow. I do have this concern some of the functions may turn out to have independent material explanations leading to some kind of a you know, causal uh, over-determination and I, I haven't thought hard about you know, how to get around that or where 
where, again, I'd want to draw the line between what is the soul's responsible and what it isn't responsible for. And regarding uh, Gary's suggestion that no one has gotten anywhere near the truth, uh, I basically agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some people have got closer than others. Yeah, sure. um, that being said, you've gotten close to some truth today, and we'd like to thank you for coming here. And, and jumping into the fray on these issues. Uh, before, we, before we ask you to either join us for um, Evensong in the smaller chapel here, or to um, buy, a, buy a ticket to Messiah on your way out, um, or both, if you'd like, uh, we'd like to, we will thank our co-sponsors, and that is um, the Ian Ramsey Center in the Faculty of Theology, the Humane Philosophy, and the Humane Philosophy Project. So, that being said, Let's give a warm round of applause for the lovely talk.